Hello, everyone. We're going to give everybody a minute or so to get started, and then uh, we'll come right back to you. Just hang on. Well, welcome everyone. Good to see you, Jesse. How you doing? Ron, great seeing you. Uh, we have a treat for you today. Uh, well, or a treatment, depends on how you feel about Bordeaux, but uh, this is uh, Saint-Emilion is what we're gonna be covering today. It's mostly Jesse covering it because Jesse, in addition to being a master sommelier, generally fantastic person and a friend of mine, also happens to be one of, I believe around 30 officially recognized Bordeaux tutors as uh, specified by the L'Ecole de Bordeaux. Is that the correct um, organization? Yeah, it's the CIVB and they run a, um, a wine school in Bordeaux called the L'Ecole de Bordeaux. And uh, I, I have an accreditation from them that I earned a few years ago. And it was a great experience, a, an intense uh, week of learning. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I enjoy continu my continued learning through them. Yeah, it's, uh, and it's open to some other doors for you. And um, seeing as craft and estate brings in Bordeaux and uh, is one of the parts of their portfolio. What a great asset to the company. And so um, as we introduce this topic, I'm Ron Edwards, Director of Wine Education for Winebow. And I uh, love this weekly interaction with my, my buddy, Jesse, as if we're next to each other, but not. And, um, you know, sent to me on is a really cool topic. It offers a lot of sort of I don't know, uncertainty, and there's definitely confusion around some of the names, especially when you start using the word Grand Cru and Grand Cru Class A. And so I'm sure that Jesse will do a great job um, clearing a lot of these things up, and I will chime in as necessary and, and to have fun. Now, I want to remind everybody on these sessions, as always, we do not monitor the chat window. We need you to use the uh, Q&A for your questions, and we'll get to as many of them as we can. No promises on all of them, but uh, we do a pretty good job of keeping up with them along the way. And Jesse, now off to you. Let's uh, let's talk about Santa Mion. Ron, thank you so much. Yeah, and uh, if this is the first time you're joining us on Between Two Psalms, uh, I'm Master Sommelier Jesse Becker, and I work for Craft and Estate. It's an an import division of Winebow, and definitely a big part of our uh, business is Bordeaux. Uh, and uh, we work a lot with uh, Centimillion. And what I, my idea, Ron, on this was, um, you know, in our wine studies, um, we've got so much to cover, especially if you're in a program like WSCT or the Quartermaster Sommeliers, that sometimes it feels like we're just touching, uh, touching the tip of the iceberg on these different topics, different wine regions around the world. Uh, but if at some point, Ron, we, you, you know, you can attest to this, we've got to dive deep into a very specific uh, area. Uh, and so I thought um, sort of as an example of that, we should uh, have a, a really sort of deep look at saint million which um, uh, is, uh, at a, of course, a very, very important uh, appellation within uh, Bordeaux. But as far as the, as, as the wine trade is concerned, some of the world's most expensive and collectible wines come from this, uh, this appellation. Uh, and so it's a very important topic, I think, to have a, a, a deep dive in uh, and just to look at this one uh, very specific appellation within Bordeaux. Yeah, I think you're right about that, especially in the idea that the left bank gets so much more, I don't know, defined. It's a little easier to understand. It's maintained its sort of clarity of this is with only one change to the classified growths in the last hundred years. I mean, it really, it really isn't an area in transition, whereas saint has been in transition for quite some time but that makes it a really exciting region. So before we get into that, let's talk about vintages and how that goes. And uh, as always, it's gonna be a little bit relevant to exactly which part of saint you're in, but I'm sure you'll hit that. True, but uh, uh, definitely, uh, and all we're doing here is just kind of looking at um, some of the more recent vintages, at least the, the vintages that we currently uh, are working with for the most part um, with our portfolio. Uh, but I just, I, I always like to um, highlight uh, these recent vintages and to just show um, what's what's been going on there as of late. And as you can see, I, try, I tried to highlight it in bold. I, I actually took these 
uh, notes from uh, the Wine Spectator's vintage uh, report. But um, you can see that on the right bank, Bordeaux, saint emilion has been getting some fantastic uh, press as of late. Some of these vintages have been really, really successful for for uh, saint emilion in particular. Um, these are mostly, of course, very ripe, warm, powerful vintages. The vintages have been uh, on the warm side. 15 is one of these vintages that we talk about as, uh, you know, it gets the, the, the vintage of the, of the decade or whatever, and there's usually a few of those every decade, but um, blockbuster wines, highly collectible, very powerful, very rich, um, should be very long lived. Um, 16, also very homogenous uh, vintage, a lot of um, ripeness and concentration in those wines. Um, I particularly like the 17s. There seems to be a little more uh, freshness in, in the wines and uh, uh, the terroir seems very precise in the 17, but all of these have gotten a great press as of late. So it's a great um, moment to be buying some um, and just to give us a little bit of uh, uh, history here, actually, there's quite a lot of history we could cover uh, because this place has been a wine making place for at least 2000 years. So this was a, um, a, a Roman um, outpost of, of wine production. Uh, so um, going back uh, to 56 BC, BC when uh, Roman colonization of the area begins, um, this is a very important uh, uh, place where uh, they brought vines with them from places where they had already um, started cultivating the vines, so like from the south of France, and they they brought them up here and grafted over to the the what what, what was native here, um, and so an important wine place for the Roman. Of course, this is a, a very common story um, throughout Europe. But when Rome falls, um, most of the knowledge of wine, wine growing, and wine making goes to the church, um, and the Benedictines uh, were very very uh, active here in the Middle Ages. And uh, there's a very important um, a person who uh, in the fourth century, uh, this Roman po poet, Estonius, um, lived here. Um, and uh, this, uh, this person gives their name to Chateau Osson. So I just wanted to point that out, out as well. Um, and uh, getting back to the Benedictines, there was this Benedictine uh, Emilion. And, and this is who lends his name to uh, the, the town of Santa Million. And um, upon his uh, death, uh, the followers of, of uh, Emilian uh, started the construction of this iconic uh, church uh, that can be seen from all over the Santa Million Appalachian. So um, this is a, um, it is a uh, church constructed of the, the limestone, which we're going to talk about quite a bit today, but the limestone um, uh, that is the, the saint Million Plateau. Uh, so um, a very old um, uh, church and sort of the, the symbol of the region. And um, I, this is a, a fascinating to me that um, there are all of these uh, caves uh, in the saint Million. Uh, Appalachian going from a different uh, different chateau into the center of town. In fact, I believe at Chateau Canon there is a, a cave that will take you from Canon all the way to the, the center of the town. And um, the reason for all of these caves uh, is that it's very much like Champagne. It's it's limestone, and it was very easy to carve and and to work. And so there's this um, this network of tunnels underneath uh, underneath Saint Emilion and and um, connecting the the town with uh, the different chateaus that surround it. So um, that is actually the um, the catacombs of that uh, that church that sits that stands in the the center of Saint Emilion. And you, so you can see they're carved just right out of the the limestone. They're carved out of the rock. So were the um, so did you get the sense that the the caves are actually they were both utilitarian at the time or were they primarily being carved to actually use the stone for building and then they became utilitarian? Or yeah, I, th I think it had multiple purposes. Definitely um, the, the stone was used for uh, constructing the town of saint Leon and constructing this church. Um, the caves are, of course, ideal for storing wine. 
Uh, so this is a very similar story to, um, to Champagne. But the other thing, like, like Champagne, I mean, I think these caves have been used for uh, protection in the past when there's been um, uh, wars and things like that. These are places where the, the, um, the residents of saint Neon could go uh, and be safe. Um, so they have, they've served multiple purposes uh, and it's just sort of a, another fascinating quirk about this, um, this very famous appellation in Bordeaux. Certainly the antithesis of the left bank, where if you dig down, all you're going to do is get wet, you know, so. Uh, that's a great point because um, you're right. Uh, this is a much, much older uh, wine growing region than, than the Medoc. Um, and it's one of the first uh, areas to, um, to start shipping wine for export, uh, which we can get to in a, a moment. Uh, but the, the, the wine growing place itself uh, goes, dates much, much older than um, the left bank of Bordeaux. Um, and while those chateaux in the Medoc were just sort of getting stout, established um, the, in the 14th century, um, shipping uh, develops, the, and part of it is their proximity to the Dordogne River, which um, flows into the Gironde, and then you could get the wines um, out to sea. Um, so these were already being shipped uh, in the 14th century uh, to England at the request of King Edward, um, and so the very, very early to establish um, a trade, a commerce around uh, the wines of this region, and it's, it's in part due to their proximity to the Dordogne. Yeah, so this, this area historically was actually controlled by England during the, when, uh, during, um, when it was called Aquitaine, and um, I just went blank in the Queen's name. Uh, the, Eleanor of Aquitaine. Yeah, and uh, this was prior to the Hundred Years' War, right? So then yeah. after the Hundred Years' War, then the Dutch get involved, and that's when we get the left bank. So. It, exactly, that's exactly right. Um, so it also has a lot to do with the, the development of this, uh, this region as wine producer. But, um, but something talk about how old it was though, we know that when Romans occupied it, they planted vines in this region on that side of the river because the other side was a marsh. So that, is that how old you're thinking or are you saying to, maybe that it even goes be earlier than that too? Well, they, they found, Romans found um, uh, the na uh, native vine growing there already and they actually brought their, um, their vine material with them like from places further south, like they had already established uh, well-established vineyards in Provence and they brought these uh, vines and grafted over my understanding, grafted over to, um, to uh, what they were used to working with. So at least 2,000 years old, but, but um, certainly there were uh, vines here even before that. Um, just something I wanted to point out here, and this, uh, this Centennial um, Wine Growers Association or syndicate um, plays, a, plays a role later on when we get to talking about the classification of uh, Centennial wines, but um, a very early uh, wine growing association here, the growers band together to promote the region and protect the region, um, and that is uh, 1884, so I just think, think a, an, an interesting historical fact to point out there. Um, and then there's all kinds of things to talk about once we get to the 20th um, century, uh, because this becomes, even though this is a very old winemaking place uh, within Bordeaux, um, <clears throat> there's a lot, lot of activity here, especially um, once we start to warm up to the 90s. Uh, and there's all of these uh, garages uh, producers um, that, that um, start to produce um, wines on a small scale out of sort of out of nowhere. And the term garages means that uh, they're making wines in sometimes a, a very small area like the size maybe of a garage, uh, but producing um, incredible wines that get a lot of attention and press from critics like Robert Parker, uh, who sort of goes hand in hand with the rise of these garages wines in the 90s. Um, and so so there's a lot of that uh, going on here. So I think by uh, 2000, I saw a number that there were around 25 pretty high profile garage wines coming out of um, Centennial alone. Um, and this is also an area where there were these um, very high profile consultants uh, who, along with the, the critics, which were being um, very closely followed at that time, sort of helped raise the, the profile of Centennial wines, but also the demand for the wines and the pricing of the wines. Mm -hmm. And so um, we'll talk about some of those, um, those consultants in a minute. But uh, it's another thing that happened here in 1999, the, uh, the town of Saint-Leon and the, the vineyards that surround it 
uh, were designated as uh, UNO, uh, UNESCO World Heritage Site. And this is a, just a, fa a beautiful place to go visit. And it, it definitely does attract a lot of uh, visitors. Um, I've been there in the middle of summer, like in August, which is vacation season for, for Europe. Um, and you are, um, this square, which is right in the heart of the town of saint is absolutely packed. Um, it's hot because it's August, uh, but it's a really nice place to, um, to have a, a glass of, uh, of Bordeaux, of saint um, and um, just sort of take in the, the history here and the, the really just the beauty of this, um, this uh, uh, town. You're sitting, if you're sitting in this little square um, having a, a glass of wine, you're sitting sort of right underneath that iconic uh, church of saint -Emilion. And uh, so this looks like you were there in the winter time. <laughs> a little bleak looking. A little bleak at this time of year. Um, so uh, I mentioned some of these important uh, consultants, and there's probably the most famous of all. That's Michelle Roland. And um, if you uh, do a Google search of all the centimillion properties that he has consulted with uh, over the, the decades, uh, it is an extremely long list. Uh, so not only is this a, um, a uh, vineyard owner, winery owner within um, uh, saint -Emilion, but also consults with so many different uh, projects and chateau um, within, within saint -Emilion. So for, just for example, um, he's worked on uh, a song on Cheval Blanc and uh, a lot of very important names in this, um, in this appellation. Yes. <laughs> Um, and what, you know, what is it that, uh, that makes him so unique or special? Um, you know, for one thing, he, uh, his rise sort of went really hand in hand with, I think, Robert Parker. Uh, and I think uh, perhaps their, their palates or tastes were very similar. So um, I always think of a Michelle Roland wine as a very rich, ripe style, very rounded with the, where the tannins are in, um, just very sort of polished. Uh, and the wine is in just, just sort of this perfect uh, balance of, of ripeness, but um, polish of tannins. And I think that's sort of the signature style of Michel Roland. And another one to talk about here, uh, Stéphane de Rinencourt, I think uh, maybe most famous for Pavi Macan, uh, but work La Mandote, uh, La Gaffaliere. Um, he had a, a hand in the sort of comeback of Inglenook in the Napa Valley in the 90s. Mm -hmm. So uh, very important uh, uh, consulting winemaker. I guess you'd call him flying winemaker. He worked not only in California, but uh, worked on some properties in Bulgari. But that's Stefan de Rinencourt. Mm -hmm. uh, and here's um, Jean-Luc Tunavan of uh, Valandro. And um, when I say garagist, um, this is a, a person that's had his hand in uh, many garagist wines. So um, Valandro kind of started as a garagist wine um, in the 90s. And then, uh, as we will see later, is sort of risen to the, the mm -hmm. upper echelon of, of saint million wines. So These, was, I was like exploring this garagist title because you hear it thrown around a lot but nobody puts a number on it and i don't know i, I like things quantified and I, I appreciated something i was reading that um oh, it was the hugh johnson's and jancis robinson wine atlas was talking about well in general we're talking about you know they make less than a thousand cases of this particular wine and the whole business model is very little wine art to artificially drive up demand for something with very high quality and they're not cutting cut corners on quality you're just never going to offer very much of it and that's sort of the economic model. Sort of uh, the same way our, um, our Napa cult wines sort of yes. rise yeah, to their- a One acre concept. You know, yeah. We should not think of these as um, little tiny um, producers who struggled from nothing to come into the wine business. They, these were sort of designed ideas, um, notable, laudable yeah. ideas, you know, yeah. raising the image of their region very successfully, but um, I think the original idea when it first hit my head was this is just some somebody who had a dream that, uh, that didn't have very much grape and you know, I don't think that's really what's that. 
Yeah. Um, so we, we are going to talk about um, these uh, Saint-Emilion Grand Cru Class A wines, these wines that have this official classification, Premier Grand Cru Class A. Uh, they're very, very famous, very expensive. But um, I always like to point this out when I'm talking about Bordeaux, that um, uh, most of Bordeaux, and this is true of Saint-Emilion also, uh, most of Bordeaux it tends to be small growers. I think the average holding here is seven hectares. Uh, there are 800 growers uh, growing uh, the uh, cultivating the vine uh, in within Saint Emilion Appellation alone, and so most of those, of course, are not these famous um, Chateau Canon and uh, Asson and Pavi. These are um, small growers, um, and they tend to be uh, family growers, and sometimes are wine producers, and sometimes not. So, um, and this is a very important. I think we point this out that there's two appellations here: um, the Saint Emilion AOP. Uh, and then there's Saint-Emilion Grand Cru, and Saint-Emilion Grand Cru is an appellation and not a classification uh, in this case. And it's just, um, it's just a little quirk. It's just how they've decided to name their, um, their I guess, superior appellation, um, a step above basic Saint-Emilion AOP. And all it's really saying is that it must be a state bottled, got a little lower maximum yield, a um, little longer uh, elevage or aging uh, before release. So that's a very important distinction. Since Mayon Grand Cru, an appellation, not a classification. It covers the exact same 5,565 hect hectares as Santa Million AOP. Very important uh, thing to point out, I think. Yeah, it's the, one of the biggest confusions, I think, in the marketplace for the person buying a bottle of Bordeaux or a glass of Bordeaux, um, that we have an opportunity as professionals, including the audience listening to us right now, to help clarify that for them so that we make sure that they understand what they're buying. And yeah. by seeing those two words, Grand Cru, on one wine that cost $25 retail and seeing the same two words, even though there's some other stuff added to it, and it's $125 retail or more, why that why that's justifiable in their minds. Um, that, yeah. That's a difficult bridge to cross because the words are, I mean, they're just not friendly to the consumer, mm. but we can help. Sentiment, there's 65 appellations within uh, Bordeaux. So we're just talking about one of them today and it's Saint-Emilion right on the Dordogne River, which eventually you can see flows into the Chiron. Um, and this is my, this might be my favorite map of this uh, presentation. Uh, I love this, uh, this sort of topographical map. So we get a sort of feel of the, the top, not only the topography, but also um, we have a geological chart there. Mm -hmm. And I like this because uh, the geological chart is also sort of our varietal map. So it, it kind of gives us a sense of what varietals are grown where, of course, Saint-Emilion are Merlot-based wines. Uh, in and that's true, of course, of the right bank. Uh, but uh, where we have, if you'll look up to the sort of top left-hand corner of the, the screen there, you see Chateau Cheval Blanc and Figiac. They're actually closer to the border of Pomerol. And we have these uh, very famous sort of gravel there. Uh, and therefore, we see more Cabernet Sauvignon and Cabernet Franc, especially in the case of Cheval Blanc. Um, you can see the, the sort of classic zone uh, for the top producers are what we call the coat. Uh, those are the um, sort of orange hillsides that you see indicated there, and some very famous names on these coat or uh, hillsides, and that's this, um, this limestone, the, the, the the slope of the limestone plateau on on which Saint-Emilion, the town, and the, the rest of the Appalachian sits. Uh, and so this is a very important distinction from the left bank, for sure. They don't really have this kind of geology at all in the left bank. And so um, it is also the, the reason we have uh, a predominance of Merlot in this Appalachian. That's a, a really helpful map, I think. Yeah, I love this map. And it really tells a story in so many different ways. Um, and when you start, if you think back to the pictures of the church and the pictures of the buildings and all of that solid block limestone that's, that's being harvested right there, and, and you take a look at this map and you can see where the uh, softer materials were and where the water eroded it faster and you get those beautiful hillsides. And the advantage of the hillside here is it drains frost in the spring, the, you know, and um, in, in Bordeaux is not exactly a dry region, so this is a place where you want to shed some water once in a while, and being on those hillsides makes a huge difference. And there's a shallowness of the topsoil also on those coats, which uh, forces a little bit of a 
a bit of more struggle for a vine in a fairly, well, a, a very comfortable environment for vines. Yeah. And uh, we, why do we keep talking about soil? Everybody's, you know, we get picked on a little bit for why you keep talking about soil. I don't, I don't see how that really affects. And what it really boils down to is that the vineyard geology dictates grape chemistry. Yeah. The way the vine functions and, and what the actual end result chemistry is of the grape juice, which in, a, in that is what changes flavor. It's not so much that there's suddenly limestone in my wine, it's that it changes the way the, me, the metabolic processes work in the vine. So now all of a sudden you have a very different kind of experience. Absolutely, and pH changes with soil type, and, and those things very much influence the taste. And just, uh, yeah, we, we are crazy about talking about rocks, I guess, uh, Ron and I, and just to uh, belabor the point, um, there, there's the entrance to some of these caves I spoke of right in Centimillion, so the, a very deep network, network of caves like what we might find in Champagne. Okay, this um, is an important slide because we need to talk about, this sort of gets us into the uh, classification uh, that exists here, um, and very much unlike the classification of the Medoc, which happened, of course, in 1855. This happened 100 years uh, later, at least they completed it in 55 and acted in 58. Uh, and the Growers Syndicate, who originally, originally put this classification together, intended that it would be re revised every uh, 10 years. And that's, of course, very different than the Medoc. And so you can see there's been revisions um, in 86, 96, 2006, I put an asterisk next to because um, some chateau were not uh, very pleased about their demotion, uh, and they uh, they um, well they decided to go to court over it, and it, it remained in the courts for uh, a long time. Uh, it's finally sort of been settled, I guess. Uh, maybe we could say in the 2012 um, revision. Um, but with the big change that happened between 06 and 12 is that now the uh, classification revision is conducted by the INAO. So uh, in theory, we've got a, th a third party now. Uh, and they, they take into account all kinds of things about the terroir that the Chateau sits on, et cetera. But there's also a very important you know, a tasting. They look at the reputation, the overall um, quality of the wines for the last decade. And, and that's how this is, in theory, supposed to work. Um, yeah. The stuff I was reading today sort of explained it as 50% of its evaluation is really experiential, meaning yeah. a judge of experts. And 50% of it now is also based on, you know, where the vineyard is and, and that sort of stuff. Um, I really like the fact that they changed the way the tasting is working. And one of the big objections, which was never really explained to me very clearly, uh, was the idea that the up and coming chateaus were tasted by themselves instead of in a grouping with the current Grand Cru Class A A's. Or you know, like if you were trying to get into class B, you were tasted by yourself instead of along what you consider to be your peers, which, you know, honestly, I can see why they objected to that. That how am I supposed to show that I'm as good as all these other wines if I'm not in the same tasting panel? Yeah, and by the way, this whole classification thing is very French. I mean, we would never really do anything like this in in California in the New World. Uh, not that not that I anticipate, uh, but it's very important to these uh, these producers that they maintain these um, their status or try to raise in, in status. And so here's how it sits now as of uh, 2012. There are 72 classified uh, estates for uh, uh, 18 of which are called Premier Grand Cru Class A, and the Class A part of that is the classified part. Uh, so and that's divided into two categories A and B. Um, and there are now four, four uh, chateaux within this A classification, and the other 14 are in B. And then you can see there's also 64 Grand Cru Class A without this, um, this premier part of the name. So that's kind of how it, it breaks down. And um, you can see that uh, at the very sort of top, very tip of the pyramid, there's this premier Grand Cru Class A. a and that's just four producers. And so that's how the, the uh, classification looks in sort of pyramid form. And uh, this, is, um, this is from uh, vintages 05 to 09. This is Livex, which um, tracks and monitors the price of uh, uh, mostly of collectible uh, wines. Um, and uh, this is in British pounds, by the way. But the only reason I'm really showing this is just I wanted to show that um, uh, this is another reason it's so important to these chateaux to achieve these very um, high um, 
echelons of the, the classification system is because they, they really, um, the price is really soar uh, for producers like um, Pavi who, uh, who joined the ranks of class A in 2012. So. Mm -hmm. um, and suddenly it's, suddenly it's like uh, I can change all kinds of economics in my winery. I can, I can oh, do yeah. a brand new winery like Cheval Blanc's pictures are now. That place is unbelievable. But it's hard to do that when you're making, you know, twenty dollars a bottle as opposed to two hundred. So, yeah, here they are. Yeah, there's the the um, the top four: uh, Asson, all very famous names: Asson, Pavi, Angelus, and Cheval Blanc. Uh, and then there's just the one step down. There's uh, fourteen of these uh, producers. Uh, some of these um, uh, probably are more familiar than others. But um, for example, Chateau Canon is one that. Uh, a lot with uh, in our our uh, portfolio at uh, Craft and Estate, uh, but you can see. Oh, another thing I wanted to point out on this slide is you can see there's Valandro, and what that started in uh, the '90s as a garage used garage wine. So, um, I just thought everyone might be interested in this. Um, uh, you know, going back to this slide, how how do we actually go about uh, buying these wines? Sometimes it's the way Bordeaux is. Um, traded is it's very different than really any other category of wine out there um, because they sell their wines on this open market called the Place de Bordeaux and it's it's not the easiest thing to um, to uh, understand because it's uh, it's different than just about any other uh, way any other wine is sold so I had this incredible opportunity last week uh, to um, to interview a negotiant an actual negotiant from Bordeaux Alain Sichel he was great and he said, did such an amazing job of explaining all of this to me the Place de Bordeaux system the negotiants the courtiers on Premier and if, it, if that's of interest I um, we've got the link there um, I know you can't Probably can't click that, but you can all email me for the link uh, or uh, just Google the inner working of the Bordeaux wine trade. I think people might really uh, enjoy seeing that. We just, and, why don't we just email that link out to all those who's, who registered today? Um, I think that I, I'm planning, I watched five or 10 minutes of it before we got on and I'm like, oh, I got to go back and watch the rest of this. This looks great. Yeah, and it's uh, it's not really you know, everybody's uh, heard me talk enough. This is actually uh, Alan Seychelles doing most of the talking, and um, I think it's great to hear all of this stuff directly from someone who uh, who whose life's daily work is uh, is the trade of Bordeaux. And uh, we just wanted to highlight the two um, two uh, pr uh, properties that we. Uh, we uh, work with exclusively in our craft and state portfolios. We have a uh, great pleasure of working with uh, La Pagnotte Bellevue uh, and Croix Canon, which is the second wine of Chateau Canon. Uh, so check uh, with your wine bill rep about that. And uh, I, th I think we, I see a question up here. Yeah, I want to remind everybody, because I'm sure that we didn't cover everything on your mind. You need to put your communications in the Q and A. Um, we are not really monitoring the chat window, so look for the Q and A button. Um, so we got a first one to deal with here, and we'll see what you what you know about this one. I don't know anything, so I can't help. And that is, uh, what is the controversy of the? I think the intention is collusion, of the or conclusion of the lawsuit of Chateau L'Angelou, and your uh, opinion of it. So. What? What I will do on that, because I'm not, I'm not sure if that is tied to, um, to 2006 or 2012, but um, I, will, um, I will answer that question for you directly in an email because I'm not quite sure what the question is yeah. uh, referring to. So, we'll ask, we'll but, ask um, thank you, thank you for the question, email. She, and I'll, I'll get back to you on an, uh, via email. Yeah, Bonita, just send that email directly to Jesse. You, you can reach out to him direct. Okay, so would you say that the 2017 vintage in Bordeaux, Centimillon did better than the other regions? Is that your opinion? Uh, that was a vintage I really liked. Um, the, the wines just to me have more uh, freshness, more purity. Um, they seem to really speak of their uh, individual terroirs very clearly. Uh, and uh, I guess compared to these other very highly rated vintages of 15, 16, 18, um, give me a 17. Uh, it would be my personal preference and it's it's just the style of the wines uh, to have a little more freshness, precision, and vibrancy to them. So uh, I'm a big fan of the 17s. It sounds like back 
not that well it was a long time ago i didn't have gray hair back then um and i didn't have kids in college and 82 was being talked about left and right and up and down and great vintage this and great vintage that and the wines were soaring in prices and i started tasting the 83s and i fell in love with the 83s yeah i have one available i still love the 83s more than the 82s not that the 82s aren't good I, they're just 83s are more my style they just well very them. very famously uh margot uh made an incredible had an incredible vintage in 83 uh i mean that's the line you want not the 82 but the 83 yep. margot all right so michael is uh, asking if there's a way to get a hold of that uh, topographical uh soil slide is that something that the uh the bordeaux association has yeah, we can we can get that uh we can get that emailed out as well Okay, well, Absolutely. let's just, let's start taking notes on what goes out in that email. <laughs> so okay. far we got that, and we got the, uh, um, the, yeah. your interview. Great question here uh, from Anastasia about 86. Oh, talk about another vintage I just love. Um, in fact, that might be, um, if, if I had my choice, if I was visiting one of these famous chateaux in Bordeaux, and they, they just let me pick, what do I want to try? I would probably say, give me an 86. Yeah, even. great vintage. Terrific. It's been a bit since I've had an 86, but uh, I have a great memory of an 86 that was given to me blind. And I said, well, this is either 96 or 86. <laughs> One of those good moments in life, you know? All right, let me scroll down here and see what else we got. All right. So um, did you find Centimillon struggling to stay relevant as we see in Bordeaux at large, which is really, this is so funny that we bring this up because I say in, in the world of marketing wine and selling wine in general, Bordeaux struggles at that because you look at how much wine they make and the fact that if you go into a grocery store in the United States, you're probably not going to find a bottle of Bordeaux, um, even though they have plenty of wines that fit that category. So do we feel like saint is in the same boat or are they doing a better job of keeping saint relevant at the normal everyday wine level? Uh, this is great. Uh, thanks for the question. And um, it's something that Alan Sichel and I talked about um, last week in our, our uh, interview. And, um, you know, actually the Place de Bordeaux, when you, when you look at it, it's actually a very efficient way to service all of these uh, growers and uh, wine producers that exist in Bordeaux. Uh, so it's a big region, uh, over 100,000 hectares and lots and lots of producers and um, the negociants seem to, um, the negociant system, Place de Bordeaux system seems to service that very, very well. Uh, but we also got into some of the challenges like um, uh, the sort of lack of enthusiasm in um, en premier as of late and um, uh, all sorts of things. And just looking at how the negociant companies have been innovating as they always have. So um, some are going direct to the consumer online. Uh, that's their sort of future idea or business model. Others have set up um, offices in China, actually in the US as well. Um, and so I think uh, I think this um, one of the big takeaways from that from for me uh, was that really uh, the negotiants are really trying to connect directly with the, the consumer, the, the person that's actually going to, to drink the wine. And just to see this sort of initiative and um, uh, uh, willingness to adapt, um, I think, means uh, means that they're always uh, try to position themselves to um, to be uh, in a very good spot in the market and, and uh, always trying to make a comeback. So, yeah, because I mean, there's a lot of wine to sell in Bordeaux. Yes, yes. <laughs> Bordeaux, the reason this, it, yeah, it's one of the reasons these, the system exists is right. to service all of that wine. Mm -hmm. um, so, and then my all-time favorite from Shish, uh, they're saying '89 Angelus. That has to be a great uh, bottle. Love '89 as well. So, be uh, quite a privilege to even try it. Are there any chateau that you two feel represents truly exceptional value at a high quality level? We didn't talk. We didn't talk about this, uh, but you know that um, all of these uh, chateaux um, produce a second wine, and sometimes they even produce a third wine. Uh, and one of the um, sort of secrets to this is to um, to really give those second wines some attention. So there's always the Grand Ban, the um, the, the top wine that they produce, and then they've make it, made a selection. And sometimes the second wine can be just fantastic. A great case in point was, uh, showed a slide with Qua Canon, that's one we work with a lot. And Qua Canon is a fantastic wine from the yeah. uh, Premier Grand Cru Classe B Chateau Canon. Uh, the other thing, Ron, uh, I, I love the question. So I was gonna say, and, um, you know, we 
we talk about and we're talking about them today, those classified chateau, very famous names mm -hmm. of the garage East wines with cult followings, but the most of Bordeaux uh, is small growers, small producers. And if you're willing to look to some of those um, uh, smaller petite chateau or not as famous names, especially in a great vintage like you have now, you're going to find some great value. Yeah, one of my favorite things to do when I'm writing wine list or when I was writing wine list before was to go out and find those items in like my last consulting job. I was still buying 2010s and 2012s from the unheralded names and just giving them a whirl. And, you know, we're spending $17 wholesale for wines that are just delicious uh, from great vintages. Um, so that, that really is the secret with Bordeaux in general is that there are a lot of really delicious high quality wines made across the board that we you've never heard of and you just have to be willing to go ahead and pick up the bottle there's another there's a, another question here that is really relevant and then we'll probably bid everybody everybody goodbye and that is the idea of thinking that bordeaux was large concerns with large vineyards and you know, tracks and tracks of land as opposed to Burgundy being, you know, I own these two rows, etc. And I think I'll, I'll wait in and let you finish. Burgundians still own several to even teens of hectares of vines, but they very rarely own very much of any single vineyard. So when you start talking, when you translate that to Bordeaux and you say the average Saint-Emilion producer has seven hectares, well, I think that's what you said. But take, yep, the, the average close. grower, land landowner has seven hectares. Mm -hmm. Which is, that's about the same as your average Burgundy um, grower. Uh, uh, not the same as a negociant in Burgundy, but. Yeah, and um, so probably the largest uh, chateaus in uh, Saint-Domingue have about 50, 60 hectares. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, the, they are the, the chateau, the producer. When I said there's 800 um, growers uh, and their average holding is seven hectares, I'm talking about people that may not necessarily make their own wine. Um, they may be selling to co-op or um, a, to a negociant uh, who will do the, the bottling and the selling of that wine. So there's a, a distinction to be made between um, an actual producer, let's call it a chateau, uh, and a, a, somebody who's a, a grower. Right. So the great question. Thank you for that. Uh, the folks that we see actually as chateaus, but even then the average holdings for chateaus through the region is not as large as sometimes we think. We're talking about it, teens, right? Like, yeah, it may be, um, you know, it may be 10, 15, 20 hectares. I, I don't know what the average chateau size would be, but it's probably in that range. We, we think of Bordeaux from the perspective of the grand names with the grand homes and the huge price tags, but that is literally the tip of the iceberg. There is so more Bordeaux out there to enjoy, including wines that we should drink on Thursdays and sometimes on Tuesdays. Uh, and so I, I would encourage everybody to go out and find some Bordeaux and remind themselves about why this is such a highly lauded wine region. If you haven't had one lately, it's time. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, so there you go. And so next week we're gonna talk about Provence, eh? Provence, and uh, we're really looking forward to that. It is time to start drinking some Provence Rosé. So we're gonna definitely address that and also um, some of the other great wines that come from the south of France. I've had two bottles of Figuier in the last four days. I'm all in, let's do it. That sounds about right. All right, Perfect. thanks everybody. Thank Loved having you on the, on the webinar today. Thanks for joining us and taking time out of your lives again. And thank you, Jesse, for putting in all the work and effort to build these slides and to be uh, so expert on these subject matters. Such a joy to chat with you. Thank all right, you, everybody. Have a good day. Bye.